in our consideration of the truth of Jesus the Christ and of those anointed ones who are called Christians. Lord's Day 12 reminds us that Jesus is the wonderful chief prophet and teacher, the only high priest and the eternal king. Lord's Day 12, printed in your bulletin, reminds us that we are members of Christ by faith and partakers of his anointing. I say in our consideration of these things that are summarized in the Catechism of Jesus the Christ, and we Christians, we want to read once again from 1 John 2 and Start reading again at verse 18, where John is speaking of a crisis. Even in the first century, the apostle John speaks of the time in which he writes as the last hour. That's a striking and unique statement regarding the urgency of this dispensation. For certainly, literally, it was not the last hour before Jesus came uh, literally, and nor the last day, but certainly there was a sense of urgency in John's mind, giving him to write this way, and for all of us and all time to remember the urgency of this day. It still is the last hour. It still is the time when Jesus is coming quickly. It still is the time when antichrists are abounding and seeking to undermine the faith of God's people in Jesus the Christ. With that said, let's read 1 John 2.18, little children. It is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? That's the lie. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. These things I've written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that any one teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him." We consider and continue to consider in this second sermon on the subject of the Christ, the fact that Jesus is the Christ. This is the confession of the Christian church, confession of the Reformed Christian church, the Presbyterian Christian church, the ecumenical church of all ages that has not left at least this confession. Jesus is the Christ, the one with the title, the one with the authority, to be the Savior from God and the Savior of sinners. There is, in this day, a crisis of ignorance. There is a global ignoring of Jesus. We like to speak of global warming as the crisis, but the real crisis, the crisis of crises, is a global ignoring of Jesus the Christ. There is as well in this time when we um, hear that there's an emergency of national uh, uh, scope, even in our nation, something that has to do with immigration and the defense of borders. 
Uh, in this day, the real emergency is, is ignored and not known at all, and it's an ecclesiastical one, a church emergency, because the church is leading the way in ignorance, is doubly judged for her ignorance and rejection of Jesus, even though and while she confesses that Jesus is, excuse me, is the Christ. Ignorance of Jesus is the crisis of our times and of this very hour. That's why John writes, and that's why we would preach from this perspective of 1 John 2, where, when he's speaking of Antichrist and it being the last hour, and of this whole world that's against us, which we are not to love because it lies in wickedness, at that time, he would encourage the little children, the middle-aged ones, and the elderly ones, that we are those who can be assured of one thing, that in the middle of the ignorance, we have an anointing from the Holy One. We are Christians. We have the Holy Spirit. And in the middle of the ignorance, we know all things. There's the tremendous gospel that God gives through John to the people to whom John writes, but also to whom he would preach this morning. We know all things by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We are kept by the power of God and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the life and fellowship of God. These things, John wrote, these things I now preach that we may be assured of them and encouraged in them and abide in these things of the Christ and of our being Christians. So once again, we consider the Holy One and his anointed ones. I want to revisit briefly the, the, uh, the point of Christ being coming and it being a crisis everywhere he went. I want to focus this morning on the fact that we are Christians among the doubly ignorant in the church world. But then I want to issue a calling that we go forth as prophets and priests and kings. And it doesn't matter how old you are. We go forth into this world as representatives and dignitaries of the Christ whom we love and represent. As we saw last night, Jesus was all about speaking of himself as the Christ <clears throat> and identifying himself that way, even though at times he would hide that uh, identity of himself so that people would not get all in a dither and seek to make him king in a bad way. But little by little, he revealed to people that he was the Christ when he came on the earth. That is... He revealed to them that he was the anointed one of God, the one with the Holy Spirit of whom the Old Testament spoke, who was the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed with oil one, represented in the Old Testament by the pouring of oil upon office bearers in the, con in the congregation of Israel. Jesus was that one, par excellence, the prophet of prophets, the priest of priests, the king of kings, the one who would really be the savior of Israel and the representative of God in Israel. Remember what we saw last time. Jesus takes up the book of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah in the synagogue of Nazareth, his hometown, and he reads from the prophecy of Isaiah 61, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, and so on. And Jesus, when he picks up that book and reads that book, and then when he sits down, you remember what happened. He began to speak to them. He began to speak to them, Luke 4 tells us, of these things being fulfilled. But it seems as if he was stopped. He was cut short in the beginning of his exposition of how he fulfilled Isaiah 61 by 
the rumblings and rustlings of the crowd in the synagogue. They were not liking that Jesus would say that he is the one who is the Messiah. They couldn't get it. They were ignorant. That was their problem. And so they say, is this, this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Is he not just that son? And, and we all know, don't we, that he was, uh, that there was something shady and nefarious about Joseph and Mary's relationship. Jesus is an illegitimate child. How could he be the one who fulfills Isaiah? How could he be the Holy One, the Anointed One, the Savior? And we knew him as a to toddler. We knew him as a boy, just, just one of us, and we took him on our knee, and he was a center of attention as someone who was just a little kid, and, and so on. And they couldn't get the fact that he was speaking of something transcendent, something higher than them, something higher than their experience and, and more lasting and compelling than blood. Jesus is the one born of the Spirit, the one of God, the Savior. Well, Jesus, of course, is, um, speaks in judgment to these people. And a brother reminded me of this. And looking at Luke 4, I can see uh, more and more that Jesus came to Nazareth to pronounce judgment upon this people that would reject him. And citing the fact that the prophets in the Old Testament went outside of Israel to do their heal healing because the people didn't know God and didn't want God in their ignorance. And so Jesus closes the book, and the book is, of salvation is really closed upon Israel at this time. Judgment has come. And as Isaiah says, he proclaims liberty to the captives. He proclaims the acceptable year of the Lord, but also the day of vengeance of our God. So there it is, the crisis of the Savior. He comes and he is the savior of his own, but he comes and he's not admired. He's not desired, even as the prophet Hosea, was it, says he should be. He's the desire of all nations, but he's not the desire of Israel. He's one who should be known. They have the law, they have the testaments, they have the covenants, they have the promises. To them pertains even, according to the flesh, the coming of the Christ, but they don't recognize him. He comes to his own, and his own don't receive him. They don't know him. And later on, they'll crucify him. And Jesus in that, of course, will prove that the one they don't know is the one God knows and has set aside, as our catechism reminds us, to be the only Savior, the only Christ, the only one we need, the only spokesman of God, the only one who speaks powerfully and commands salvation when he speaks, the priest who's anointed and who's anointed to die as also the lamb, the sacrifice of the priest for sin and for sinners, for you and for me. Jesus, the great high priest of our salvation, ever living at the right hand of God, Jesus the King, coming again, John says, and cites the hour because he's looking forward to it and because he's moved by the Holy Spirit to remind us all that it's the urgency of all the time since Jesus has come. And the Bible de de uh, depicts that time since Jesus has come as very short, and here's why. Because there's nothing left on the timetable of God himself other than the last coming of Jesus. And so everything is not rushing on, but proceeding apace according to the counsel of God, whereby he's working all things according to his pleasure, so that salvation and the fulfillment of all things, not just the fulfillment of the scripture of Isaiah in the humbled Savior, but the fulfillment of all things in the exaltation of the Savior is coming very, very quickly. Is that how we live? With an urgency that we're not going to eat and drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. And even that we're not going to eat and drink and be merry for today we might die. 
But we're going to do all to the glory of God for he's coming this very hour. Children have that perspective. Parents instill in your children that perspective early on. And the way you do that is living as well as talking to them about the urgency of being a Christian in this life to represent the worth of the Savior and the worth of that one event is coming again because we know when he came the first time, he died for our sins, and since then he's died, his death was applied to our account by the Holy Spirit. That's my second point. Now we're Christians. Christ came, came among the ignorant, he was rejected. Now Christ comes, and he doesn't reject us who would naturally reject him. You know, let's not put ourselves above those Jews at the first who were just flabbergasted by a claim that Jesus would make that this day, when he comes and reveals himself, the things of God and prophets are fulfilled. We shouldn't be there ridiculing the Jews but for the grace of God, we wouldn't know it either. The disciples had a hard time recognizing that Jesus is the Christ and all kinds of earthly conceptions of his kingdom. And they weren't really content with prophecy, as, as were the uh, Jews themselves. They wanted a miracle. Give me a word, give me a wonder, and, and not a word, just a plain old word. Words can't get anything done. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? Jesus, the word, comes to get it done, to save sinners. And they say words can't get it done. In word was a deed of Messiah. Because a word in him is a word indeed, is the very truth of God with us. Be that as it may, Jesus Christ has come and amidst the crisis of our own willfulness and natural rejection, he comes with grace, and he overwhelms us and causes us to be born again. Now, that's the truth that the Catechism brings out, the truth of the Bible, the truth that's astounding and lovely and empowering the truth of our Christianity. Christianity is about Christ making Christians. Called that the first place in Antioch, wasn't it? And Christians were first called Antioch, or excuse me, Christians in Antioch. And it seemed a, a pejorative word, that is a, a, a bad word. Oh, you Christians, like they might have said to Luther. Oh, you Lutherans, oh, you Calvinists, oh, you whatever. Anyone who follows somebody is just a follower and, and not much of an uh, individual thinker and creative and so on. You're just a follower. Well, they might have said that to Jesus. Oh, you're Christians. You're hoodwinked by him. Well, to us, it's a badge of honor, isn't it? And ever since it's stuck, Christians. And the remarkable thing about that name is that it identifies us as one who part, ones who partake of the anointing because there's Christ in there, isn't there? Christ, Christians. It means as Jesus is the Christ anointed with oil, that is, uh, with the presence of God and the power of God, so are we anointed with oil. Now John reminds us of this in 1 John 2. He says, in encouraging the saints who are sticking with him, they're not the ones who left and not the ones who become Antichrist. He said in verse 20, But you, in distinction from those who left, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. And clearly the anointing is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's uh, the, similar to the word that's mentioned here. And it's a reference to the fact of our new birth. When we are born again, we are given the Holy Spirit. Remember it says that 
Jesus says to Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he goes on to explain how that happens. By the will of God, the grace of God, and the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of life. And so, we're reminded of this, what we have as Christians in 2 Corinthians 1, 21. Now, he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. How has he anointed us? 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 1, 22. Who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Now, this is an amazing gift. Let it not be lost upon us. This is what we have if we be Christians. This is what we need, this anointing, if we would ever be Christians. A man and a woman and a boy and a girl must be born again to see the kingdom, to understand the things of the Christ, to be Christian in heart and all over the place. Because that's the idea of anointing, you know. It's like oil that permeates everything, comes and flows down the beard of Aaron, goes to the hands and goes to the elbows and goes to the knees and to the feet and and even inside. It's something that infiltrates and someone who infiltrates the very being of a person so that a person comes, as Paul says, becomes a new creature by this anointing. And it's all because, you see, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is, is the presence of God now with us. In Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ goes away. He says, but fear not, when the Holy Spirit is come, the Father and I will join him. That's how he describes the wonderful going away and then the wonderful return in the book of John in the Gospel of John. The going away of Jesus should not depress people because when Jesus is exalted to the right hand of God, he receives of the Holy Spirit so that now in the economy of salvation, what Jesus does there on the cross is applied to us here on this earth and in our hearts. And Jesus is in the middle with the Father and with the Spirit And we are the temple of God. Now, New Testament temple of God. It's striking. The Old Testament tabernacle, is it Exodus 33, 32? The section speaks of Moses being commanded to anoint the tabernacle that they made, the place, the meeting place of God, with oil. To make the oil get it ready, and sprinkle the tabernacle and everything in it. All the utensils and altar of incense and all that. Well, that's what's happened to us. When John says to encourage the people, you have an anointing, you have an anointing, he's speaking of the fact that we're the tabernacle. We're the New Testament temple of of God. This is where people know God. And they come to meet with Him in the tabernacle. When you wake up in the morning in your conscience, there's God there, and the light is on there, and the worship of God continues there. Now in the name of Jesus. Now in a spiritual way, in an earthly temple, uh, earthly tabernacle, but you, earthly beings, indwelt by God to be his tabernacle, temple, the place where God dwells. This is beautiful. This is the blessing that we have. And John is, is one who uses the metaphors of describing the blessings of the presence of God in three ways. He says it's, it's about life, and then it's about light, and then it's about love. You can read the Gospel of John, the Epistles of John. He loves to bring to us in the Spirit through him the things of salvation in these ways. It's about life that we have with God and light and love. Beautiful. That's what we have. So we're no longer ignorant. In fact, John highlights, and this may be peculiar, He highlights the fact that as Christians, as those anointed, we have knowledge. 
And not just any knowledge, and not just knowledge of a few things. But did you see that? We know all things. You have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. And I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. And he emphasizes this again in verse 27, that the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Knowledge. Now what's he talking about here? I think he's talking about, well, the knowledge that we have through appropriating things in our mind. That's what knowledge is in the Bible. It's not just a feeling. It's something to do with God working in our minds to, so that they're transformed, as Paul says, and we are by the renewing of our mind. And so the Exodus is all about letting God's people go, but also letting God's people think. And this is one of the, the blights upon Christianity. They say, God will let you go, but you don't have to think. And ignorance is the mother of devotion. No, knowledge is so important. And the ministry of the church is a teaching and preaching ministry. And we catechize and we raise our children in the fear and in the knowledge of God. And so this is knowledge. And, and it's something more, of course, than just head knowledge and knowledge of facts and really the Bible never distinguishes between head and heart knowledge but it's all of a piece and it should be when we're knowing God with our minds it's knowing which is life and which is love and which is fellowship this is the beauty of the covenant of grace God knows us we know him it's beautiful it's love it's life it's light with God you see, that's why the oil flows down a beard, flows down into our hearts. It's about everything about us. And so it's a whole person that's converted to God, and it's never the same. We know all things. Now, what does that mean? <clears throat> Catechism students, did you know all things in your test? I said you did well. That didn't mean you knew everything. Do we know chemistry? Most of us would say, what's that? Do we know rocket science? Most of us know. We don't know that. What's the reference here? What's the reference here to all things? What's John saying? Is he just over-speaking himself? Is this what Christians do? We, we know everything. We know it all. Is, is that, of course not. It couldn't be. Well, look at the text. Definitely, he's speaking of the truth here. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it. So 1 John 2, verse 20, is to be interpreted in light of its context. You know all things. That's what the anointing of the Holy One does, and from the Holy One. And it's about the truth. And the truth, of course, is, well, the truth of the gospel and so on. But uh, that all things is still a little bit disconcerting, maybe, to some of us. What, is, what does that mean? Does that mean we know all the mysteries of the truth? Does that mean that we know everything that God knows? And, and as God knows, uh, you know, so that we can comprehend him not only, but just know completely uh, as God does. Well, it, that can't be that because that would be the height of your reverence. God is God, and what he knows is uh, far beyond what we know, though we know clearly and accurately, and let's not think that we really don't know anything like God does. That's not true. We're his children. Well, what then is the text being? Well, I think it has something to do with this. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 2 and 3, we read this. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us, notice, all things, 2 Peter 1, 3, that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, and so on. I believe that this is the illusion here. 
When John says we have the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God, and so that there's this knowledge, this intelligence, this understanding of all things, he's referring to all things that we need to know, even as is given us, all things that pertain to life and godliness. Everything you need to know to be a child of God Everything you need to know about God, everything you need to know about the gospel, everything you need to know about yourself, so that you're not stuck on yourself, but you repent and turn to God. Everything you need to know to live the next day as a Christian. Everything you need to know to discern the truth from the lie. John even brings this out, and this is one of the encouragements. You have an anointing from the Holy One. And you know all things. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. John is speaking here of discernment. When you have the Holy Spirit, you can tell what's not holy. And you can tell what's not of the Holy Spirit, but is a spirit from Satan, sent to deceive even the people of God. And this, beloved, is exactly the comfort we need today. That we and our children can know all things that pertain to life and godliness and Jesus Christ and growth in him. And do that and know that in the midst of a mixed up ecclesiastical world. This is what John is referring to. It's an ecclesiastical apostasy of which he's speaking. People left John and left the fellowship of the apostles. They left the miracle workers and the word bringers, and they left the congregations of the true churches of Jesus Christ. And they left, however, not denying the whole truth, but denying some of it. That's the, the implication we can derive from what John is saying here. They left, and they left kind of craftily. They left, and maybe they were saying, John and the others don't have this thing right about Jesus being the Christ. Jesus being the eternal Son of God. You see, right after John wrote this, and in the midst of this, and right after Jesus died and rose again and ascended to heaven, the devil let all hell out on the earth so that the church would have to deal with his hellions. They couldn't get Jesus on earth, now we'll get his body, the church. And it'll bring in all kinds of lies, and the principal one is lying about the Christ. But we're given to know that no lie is of the truth. And the idea seems to me, we're given to know To know a lie when we hear one. To know a half-truth when we hear one. That's what we're hearing today in the ecclesiastical world. I don't know how much you stick your head out of uh, your own world, how you're involved with other people in different churches and so on, or how much you read and so on, but if you just read the Grand Rapids Press, it's pretty dis dismal in the religion page and so on. The pastors and elders and, and fathers, too, and, and all of us who, who are able to do these things are called to discern the times. And the times, they're messed up, not just politically and whateverly, but ecclesiastically. So it's about half-truths now. Grace. John tells us we know the truth and we know all things that pertain to life and godliness, and that must mean we know grace, and we know that salvation is all of grace. That's the truth. The lie is salvation is partly of the will of man. It's not all of grace. But the text says that no lie is of the truth. It's not even a part, a part true. It's, it's the lie. You can't mix the truth and the lie. This is what John is saying here. There's antithetical truth statements that the Bible makes. Jesus is the Christ, 
This is what the Catechism affirms. And there are no other Christs, because you see, if he's the Christ, and if it's fulfilled what Isaiah says and what all the prophets say in Jesus, then it's not fulfilled in anyone else, any other prophet, any other movement. Because either he is the Christ and his salvation is sufficient, his cross is enough, his atonement is atonement, or he's not. No lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. And God's predestination is the truth. God predestinates his own. And that he doesn't is the lie. Or that he waits with his predestination for us to believe or not, and then maybe he predestinates is the lie. We've been seeing that in our discussion of the canons of Dort. No lie is of the truth. No lie. No half-truth is true. No truth that says, or no, no statement that uh, declares the sinner is only partially depraved is true, because that's a lie. You see how important it is to be solidly biblical and reformed in these last days of the Christ in this age of double ignorance. And I call it that because there's a, a knowing that was rejected. That's what's called the great apostasy, of which Paul speaks to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 2. Before the Antichrist comes at the end of time, not just many Antichrists, but there'll be one final Antichrist, the head of Antichristian Babylon, the whore of Revelation. At that time, just before it, there's going to be a great apostasia, apostasy. That's the falling away from the truth by those who once held to the truth. How does, how does that work? Well, you see it. You've seen it in former denominations, maybe, from which you've been led out. Little by little, a denial, basically, of the authority of the Word of God. Little by little, instead of the Word, culture must inform us. And we must say that if Paul were more cultured with 20 centuries of more culture behind his belt. He wouldn't have written Romans 1 in such outlandish and prejudiced statements against homosexuals and so on. The enlightened Paul, enlightened by all of our years of experience, he would have said something different. The Bible would have been differently written, more wise, more relevant to our age, if they just had the wisdom of Ann Landers and whoever else proposes to be wise. We are Christians among the twice ignorant, and the twice ignorant are doubly wicked. That's how the Bible speaks of ignorance that's twice ignorance. You knew, now you don't know. This is judgment. You're receiving not the truth, you're receiving not the love of the truth. God gives people Christians, so-called, and churches over to the lie, gives them a spirit of deception so that they're deceived into thinking they're good. They're deceived into thinking that the kingdom comes one soup supper after another and no mention of Christ in the whole business and so on without the gospel. That's what I mean. Careful, careful. It's all about the Christ and knowing all things that pertain to what? Life and godliness, according as we've been delivered from this present age, to be kept, to be kept. This is the encouragement. Christians, of what I've spoken, we ought to be glad because the anointing of the Holy Spirit testifies in us that what we're hearing is good. I see some of you nodding. We need to hear this. We live in an age where ignorance is killing the church, ignorance which is defiance, ignorance which is leaving the word of God for the words of men. And the new papacy is science. And they tell us how to interpret creation and all of these things. 
Don't fall for it. As John encourages us and says, you, you're not like that. You're not going to leave, are you? No, you're not. He doesn't even question that. He says, you're not going to leave because you have an anointing from the Holy Ghost. And when you have an anointing, you have the anointing, you have it all. <clears throat> Isn't this encouraging? And so that's why I would encourage you, even with action, reaction to the truth. And that is, first of all, be comforted. That's a command. Don't be dismal. Don't be sad. Don't be mopey. Don't be fearing for your life because, well, they're threatening to take it away or even maybe God is because you, you messed up one day. Beloved, when you have the anointing of God, the Holy One, you have the anointing that says, I forgive you. I cleanse you over and over again. Christian, this is what we say. And we really believe this is our only comfort in life and in death, I belong to Jesus. I don't belong to sin. I don't belong to circumstance. I don't belong to a bad household or a good household. Or It's not about blood, except it be about the blood of the Lamb shed for you and for me. That's the Holy Spirit teaching us this, this wonderful truth. And so be comforted and now be equipped with the truth that you know. All things that pertain to life and godliness for yourself and for all of God's people. For sinners, you call them because you're a prophet to repent and believe. That's the way. That's the truth that you know. That's the thing that pertains to life and godliness, the first thing. If you're denying him, repent of that and believe in him. It's the way to salvation. And you know among the people of God, what it is, the truth, and so you can encourage the people of God. That's a, a prophet, a spokesman. Around your tables, around your table with whomever God gives you, speak of the things of God with spirit, with life, and not just by rote. Pray, men and women, lead the congregation of your family in prayer. Lead them in a lively discussion of things eternal and things beyond Trump. Yes, beyond him. Things that are of the King of Kings and President of Presidents and of the wonderful God of our salvation. That's a prophet you must be, a spokesman, and a priest dedicated, and a king ruling first over your own spirit so that you don't give way to ungodly anger and ungodly passions and ungodly this and that. This is the realm of the Spirit. This is conviction, which is so necessary in crisis. When everybody else is leaving the boat, the good ship church, and everybody else is leaving the creeds for a modernized version of what it is to be relevant in this world, when everyone else is leaving the worship of God for something that caters to the felt needs of the teens, Stay faithful. Be convicted. You know all things. And you need not that anyone teach you, meaning you are the ones who know all the principles. And you know even when the teachers, because they're also legitimate, according to the Bible, when the teachers bring you something bad or when they bring you something good and you respond accordingly. God help us. Christians, there is the Christ for such a time as this. Amen. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus the Christ, our Savior, and that you make us to be his dignitaries and representatives. And we pray to have confidence and to go forth holding the sword of the word of God and ourselves shielded by the accoutrements of the Spirit. God bless us. Bless this congregation. Bless, we pray, all your people. May they be strong and unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the unadulterated gospel, the simple truth, the wonderful, profound truths of Jesus Christ, our God with us, in his spirit, and Jesus coming again. Amen. <clears throat>